Good morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining our event today, Taiwan's Path Forward, a conversation with KMT Chairman Eric Chu. I'm Suzanne Maloney, Vice President and Director of Foreign Policy at the Brookings Institution, and I'm delighted to welcome Chairman Chu back to Brookings. Today's event is being co-hosted by Brookings and the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS. Chairman Chu will be speaking to a, an in-person audience here in our Falk Auditorium, and we're also webcasting live to an audience around the world. Our conversation today is on the record. This event comes at an important moment. There is growing international awareness of the importance of Taiwan's security, and we are all deeply concerned about rising tensions in the Taiwan Strait. Chairman Chu's visit today provides an opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of the KMT's vision for Taiwan's future, for cross-strait relations, and for U.S.-Taiwan relations. This event today reflects Brookings' tradition of nonpartisanship, both at home and abroad. We take pride in providing a venue for candid and respectful discussions on the most pressing domestic and international issues. Taiwan certainly counts among those issues. I will soon invite Chairman Chu to the podium to deliver his initial framing remarks. Following the chairman's presentation, he will join in a conversation on stage with Ryan Haas, the Chen Fu and Cecilia Yangu Chair for Taiwan Studies here at the Brookings Institution, and Bonnie Lin, Director of the China Power Project at CSIS. As part of that discussion, Ryan and Bonnie will moderate questions from the audience. Now let me please introduce Chairman Chu. He has had a distinguished political career in Taiwan, serving as vice premier, as a legislator, as a county magistrate, and as a city mayor. In other words, he has deep experience at many levels of Taiwan's government system. He studied at National Taiwan University and earned his PhD at New York University. Chairman Chu, welcome to Brookings. The floor is yours. Thank you, Susan, for your kindly introduction. And thank you, Ryan and Bonnie, for your invitation. Especially, I have to appreciate, thank you, my old friend, Richard. Today is my third time in Brookings, but it's different role, different position. Even I am the chairman of KMT, but I'm opposition. We don't have the power to say something, but at least we have the right to say the future of Taiwan is a common awareness and a common interest for whole Taiwanese people. I would like to use the opportunity to draw up all your wisdom together and shed some light on Taiwan's future together. Before the public speech, we have a closed door round table meeting with some scholars. I thank you so much for your concern, your suggestion for us. So this time, I would like to say something about Taiwan's path forward. It's a pivotal role in the turbulent time. Nobody will see Taiwan at attract so much attention after three decades of peace era. And today, we all know it's a turbulent time. Why it is a turbulent time? Not only because U.S.-China relation, but also the international environment change during the past decades. You see what happened in 2016? It's Brexit. The Brexit and the populism come up surrounding the world. We can see what happened in UK, what happened in Asia countries, what happened in European countries, and what happened in the United States. 
2018, we saw what happened between U.S. China, especially the trade war start. During the past three years, it's a common you know, pandemic surrounding the world. The COVID outbreak, even today in Taiwan, is still under the serious situation. 2021 is global shipping disruption, caused a lot of trouble to all the international business and the trading issues. And this year, early this year, about 100 days before, what happened between Ukraine and Russia? The invasion of Russia to Ukraine not only caused the international attraction, but also tell us a big lesson, especially as a Taiwanese people. What may happen someday in Taiwan Strait, or what's the tension to the international society? What's about, what about the uh, possible or potential security or peaceful relationship between two sides? The rising of geopolitical risk during the past few years, suddenly increase. We can find it, and the war in 2022 in the world, also we can see during the past five years, a lot of major incidents and uh, the process of uh, geopolitical uh, risk. This caused, we said, that during the past Three decades is the most dangerous era, most dangerous time for all of the world. Of course, we also see the democracy in crisis. The international magazine or the, those journals said uh, how democracy ended or how democratic democracies die, everything happened. And what happened possibly for those authoritarian regimes increase and what's the decrease of democracy for the rest of the world? And how about in China? During the past few years, there is growing concern about what happened in China especially what the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, will do, will forward. You see, like a uh, few months ago, the lockdown in Shanghai caused a lot of tension. And what happened in Hong Kong for the past few years, and even in Xinjiang, or even in whole China, the media control. So, I think this grasp a huge attention to the world, what happened in China and what the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, would do in the future. Here, smile to everybody. We are here, we are back. Why we said we are here, we are back? The main purpose of my trip this time, of course, to have speech in Brookings, but also we will open, reopen our office in Washington, D.C. in the coming Wednesday. Why I say we are back? Actually, KMT had an office in Washington, D.C. since year 2000 to 2008. But we returned to power in 2008 we closed the office. Maybe we miscalculate at the moment. We thought KMT will be always as a ruling party forever. After we lost the power again, 2016, DPP became the ruling party. There, is, there was no office KMT here, but DPP still, the ruling party still kept the office in Washington. No voice of KMT in Washington, D.C., no voice of the opposition or to represent, pe to represent people in Taiwan here. 
I think it's not fair, also not good for Taiwan's democracy. We are mislabeled by some people or some media says we are pro-China party. It's totally wrong. We are pro-U.S. party forever. Since we inaugurate the party, we found the party, or we were in power or in opposition, we are the party pro-U.S., close to U.S., pro-democracy, pro-peace. We are not the party so-called anti-U.S. party. This is totally wrong. We have to come back to tell everybody in Washington, in the world, we are the party pro-democracy, pro-U.S., never against democracy. So we will open a new office in Washington the coming Wednesday. Actually, we prepare already for half a year, hopefully in the future. The voice from KMT, the voice from opposition in Taiwan, the voice represent partially from Taiwan, you can hear in Washington. The pivotal role of Taiwan, or oh, we said suddenly Taiwan is so crucial, so critical to the world. It's got the help from the Ukraine war, unfortunately. It's got the tension between U.S. and China because of the policy change or atmosphere change during the past 10 years. I mentioned to my friends in Brooklyn, I said, if year 2008, I stand here, said the engagement between U.S. and China, they say it's the right direction. The engagement from West to the East, it's the right direction. But suddenly, it's not engagement. Suddenly, it's competition. Maybe it's confrontation. So, the world changed. What's our position? What's our role of Taiwan? And what's the path for Taiwan's forward? You see, for China, from Chinese side point of view, for Beijing's point of view, we have to understand. They think Taiwan is so important because they think Taiwan is after Hong Kong and Macau. They think Taiwan is the last piece for their reunification. Especially Taiwan is after 1895, 94th Sino-China's war, Sino-Japan's war, so it's a, it's a very important significance for Chinese people. Of course, it's also a gateway to wider sea path for sea space for Chinese society. And for the U.S., for the United States point of view, you can see Taiwan is the center of the first island chain. No matter what, it's, a, it's a, even the center of the first island chain. Then you can see if United States failure to defend Taiwan's democracy were properly, I cannot say for sure, will properly undermine U.S. leadership for the Western society. I think somebody said, 70, probably 70 years ago, UK in the Suez event lost their leadership for Western society. If someday happen, United States cannot do something or cannot defend together for Taiwan, it may happen for US leadership undermined. If People Liberation Army, PLA, control Taiwan Island, 
may be a security threat to the U.S. It's also quite common in Washington today. So you can see that's the strategy for U.S. Previous one was a strategy for China. Then pivotal in global tax supply actually also quite critical for the world. Taiwan's advantage, not because of its geopolitics, but also because our high-tech, our IT supply for the world. Just to make a commercial, TSMC, the main supply for the world, was founded by KMT's administration, was founded by KMT's president, Chang ching and after then, our ex Premier Sun Yunquan. So, I said, because they are foreseen for the future, Taiwan's IT industry now dominates the world about 66% of the semiconductor chips for the world. For the high-end one, it's about 95% of the semiconductor chips supplied by Taiwan Semiconductor company, mainly TSMC and the other several. So you can, you can see Taiwan's semiconductor industry is so crucial, so critical to the global economy and the innovation race. So that's Taiwan's position. Then I said from U.S. strategy, from China's strategy, and the Taiwan's position, then we can see What's the history between Taiwan and the U.S., mainly led by KMT? We see Dr. Sen Yashen, the founding father of ROC, also the founding father of KMT. He creates, he founds our party, actually from the United States, from Honolulu and San Francisco. I just visited San Francisco a few days ago. If you visit Chinatown of San Francisco, you can find, you can find a lot of footprint of the Dr. Zheng Yashen at the moment for revolution. And during the World War II, KMT administration, KMT government, cooperate with U.S. to against fascism. During the Cold War, KMT administration and the United States together, we cooperate together to against communism. So we should set KMT and U.S. government. We are together to against those wrong way of the world. Today, Taiwan is not only the semiconductor hub but also our cultural hub for international society. This one you can see the National Politics Museum of, in Taipei. It's a fine collection of all Chinese history's treasury. And you can see our Chinese philosophy, publication, and even religion. It's all in Taiwan. So we are so proud I said Taiwan is a mix of Chinese culture, Japanese culture, Western culture, Southeastern Asian culture, but mainly we are the central of Chinese culture still. So from this point of view, we could be the hub for the Western society to the Eastern society. Then, after this presentation, you all know Taiwan's history and the importance of our position in the world. But during this pivotal era, pivotal time, crucial time, what's our decision? What's our choice? We could be a flashpoint of the world, or we could be the stabilizer of the world. If we want to be the flashpoint, some tragedy 
may happen. If we want to be the stabilizer of the world, I think it's good news for the world. We can still maintain the hub for the culture. We can still maintain the key supplier for the semiconductor. We can still be the stabilizer for the international society. So that's our choice. I don't like this kind of cover stories happen every month on those international magazine or journal. It's not a good commercial for us. So what's the KND answer to our time? I said, we have to self-guard Taiwan. We have to defend Taiwan first. Because it's under this pivotal time, we were said we have to secure the peace and the stability of Taiwan. So during the past few decades, especially during the Cold War era, or during the confrontation between Taiwan and the mainland China, we have the experience, we have seen the brutality of war and is committed it to peace and stability. We know the peace and the stability is more important than everything. Besides this, I know, and we know, if you want peace, you have to prepare the war. Self-defense is the number one for peace and stability. Strong defense and a liberal coalition are required, indispensable for this region's security. That's our promise. We think as even we are opposition. Someday we became ruling. We will always insist we have to maintain our self-defense capability and the capacity. For the two sides, cross trade. KNT's position is still under the principled, principled engagement with Beijing for cross-strait stability, threat reduction, and crisis management. So which means dialogue is still needed, contact still needed, engagement with principle still needed. We think that's the best solution, both self-defense ability plus principal engagement are good for Taiwan's are good for Taiwan's security and for the regional peace. Strength our strengthen our defense and the deterrence is our vow and our promise to the people. Recently American visitors come to Taiwan, I talk to them with my advisors together. We said we have to improve capacity and capability in a symmetric operation with enhanced joint training and exercise, which means under the overall defense concept, a symmetric capacity and capability are both very important for Taiwan. And we have to prioritize prioritize our investment, all our defense procurement acquisition, because we don't have so much or unlimited resources. We have to prioritize our procurement, especially for the coming near term. I would say that one is for five to 10 years, so important. For the reserve or for the training, we need a cabinet level, not an agency under the defense, because it will link together with all the ministries together. So I would say we have to enhance to a cabinet level to have this reserve mobilization, and we have to reform Taiwan's draft service based on 
that combat support urban and critical infrastructure defense. All this reform, we will talk the details in the future if there is uh, some you know, speech, our advisors, our cons consultants would like to present to all of you. The democracy. Liberty and the democracy is the central of KMT's theme, KMT's thinking. It's a founding vision for us. We never, never step back for anything regarding to human rights, liberty, or democracy. We, will, we fight with Americans, as I said, in World War II and against communists in Cold War, and our democracies uh, reform during the past three decades. Everybody can, wisdom, can, can, be, can witness this reform. So we vow to defend Taiwan's democracy and being compromised by any force. As I said, Taiwan should be the intercultural dialogues. Western, Eastern, Southeastern Asia, Japanese, all can through Taiwan be the channel, be the hub to dialogue. Even Taiwan can preserve as a hope for Chinese democracy. You know, Taiwan can have the democracy, why not China someday? We have to wait for this happen, but we need Taiwan as a model. To help, to, Taiwan can also help the West to better understand China, and we can be a channel for all our friends in the Western society to under the Eastern society. So to protect Taiwan as an open hub, to facilitate the intercultural dialogue, to protect Taiwan as a hub for our high-tech companies, to protect Taiwan as a hub for democracy. So Taiwan could be the hub. Everybody can use Taiwan as a hub. Finally, not the last one, if you visit KMT, why I want to say this one? Because a lot of people ignore this, this slogan for KMT. If you visit KMT Central, you can see these nine words in Chinese character. In English, it will be self guard Taiwan. It will be defend democracy and pursue or fight for our future. You see, KMT's main thinking, this nine word, just as I talk to you, hold the speech. We safeguard Taiwan. We defend our democracy. We fight for our peace and secure and prosperity future. Ladies and gentlemen, today I'm here. It's not only to tear off the wrong label to us, but also to bow to all our friends in Washington, in the world, we were together to fight together. But we were not only from the party's point of view, we were from Taiwan's point of view. Taiwan should make a choice. Taiwan is not a trouble, but a solution for the coming challenge. The topic of our time is not merely deterrence, but also endurance. Not only resisting autocracy, but also enlarging democracy. That's our goal. Thank you.
Uh, Chairman Chu, thank you so much for joining us in D.C. and taking the time to fly all the way out to share not only your vision, but also the KMT's vision for the future of Taiwan. So I wanted to start off with a question of unpacking a bit of your presentation to try to understand in what ways uh, KMT's view of cross-strait relations differ from the DPP's. So maybe I could start off with the question of, as you look at cross-strait relations, what are you, the top priorities for the KMT that you think differ from the DPP's, mm -hmm. or in what ways you think, as, as the KMT moves forward, you will take a different approach to cross-strait relations compared to the DPP? The purpose of KMT's office in Washington is not to compete with our government, not to uh, blame our ruling party. It's to present the voice of Taiwanese people for peace and security. So what's the differences between KMT and our government or ruling party? The number one, I should say, is under the same purpose to self-guard Taiwan, we believe we should enhance our self-defense ability. Under today's government's strategy, it's not enough to self-defend Taiwan. Second one is we still need dialogue or contact or communicate with Beijing with principle. KMT now is not the ruling party. We have no power. We have no right to talk about any political issues. But at least we can, through the channel, to help Taiwanese students, Taiwanese people, Taiwanese businessmen in mainland to solve their problem. This can soften the tension between two sides. If those Taiwanese people in China or those managers in Taiwan, I mean their students in Taiwan or their, their visitors in Taiwan get the kindly, you know, kindly welcomed, I think the tension could be softened. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for being with us today and sharing your thoughts. As you know, the United States has become more active and more focused on events in your neighborhood. Uh -huh. Is there anything that you would like to see the United States focus on more or less in Asia going forward? The, every, every attention from the U.S. will be welcome, but hopefully this kind of attention won't cause any trouble for this region. Uh -huh. So I do appreciate any kind of help from the United States, but hopefully the tension can be easier for the coming, coming years. Thank you. Uh, so, so Chairman Chu, you mentioned in your presentation that when looking at Taiwan's defense, you want to focus on, as you, in, according to your slide, near-term contingencies, which you describe in the fi next five to 10 years for mm -hmm. Taiwan. Could you spell out a little bit more what contingencies you want Taiwan to invest the most in, in terms of defense? OK. Uh, I'm not the expert of these kind of issues. But I do, I do believe, I do believe the government should not be a yes man or yes woman forever for any uh, kind of this uh, defense requirement. We should sit down and listen to a lot of experts in this kind of issue. For example, KMT was the ruling party for long decades. We have a lot of experts in defense. We suggest the government what kind of uh, asymmetric capacity or asymmetric uh, capability we need or what kind of training, what kind of joint exercise we need or what kind of reserve training we need. I think it's a, the starting point is for the good or for the benefit of Taiwan, not because we are opposition. We're going to open the floor up. I know that there are many people who have questions here. Uh, if you raise your hand, uh, our colleague will come with a microphone so that our live virtual audience can also hear your question as well. 
Uh, we'll start Shirley. with uh, Shirley. Shirley. And the microphone's on its way. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, really great to uh, have you in D.C. and to hear about KMT's plans. As you mentioned, the KMT, one of the most important legacy of the KMT is that it had built Taiwan's economy um, and set the foundation for becoming a powerhouse. Uh, and one of the biggest issues we face, of course, we as in the Taiwan um, private sector as well as the, the whole island, is that, uh, as you mentioned, U.S.-China decoupling has really changed the whole world. Yeah. So how do you propose, uh, as different than the DPP administration, to help uh, Taiwan not be harmed by this decoupling uh, and actually also ben even benefit from this kind of trend going forward as the world continues to regionalize as opposed to uh, globalize? Thank you. Shirley, thank you so much. I, I can share with you the number. The, the, the percentage the percentage of Taiwan's trading between mainland China, we call mainland China, uh, plus Hong Kong, is about 43%, 43%. And the, the percentage of Taiwan U.S. trading is about 15%. Uh, so both market, uh, both trading partner are very important to us. We know the U.S.-China trading war or high-tech war or this kind of conflicts will be not only the challenge for the party, including KMT, but also a very big challenge for those businesses. They have to refine, they have to reform their supply chain and they have to, you know, change their strategy during the past few years. Hopefully, this kind of tension could be smoother, could be easier. But KMT is ready to, if we became the ruling party, we would find a way to, 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 to salute this kind of trouble. Because don't forget, we are the ruling party. We were the ruling party during the Cold War, after the Cold War, and we find the path for Taiwan. So we have so many, so many experience, so many experts for economy. Thank you, Shuri. It's okay, Tina. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm with Voice of America China branch. Uh, my question is, you talked about uh, principled uh, in engagement with uh, China for dialogue, mm -hmm. and I haven't heard you mention anything related to uh, 92 consensus, which was the previous, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, under President Ma Ying-jeou, the uh, principle that a political foundation to engage with Beijing. So uh, are you considering a new kind of uh, framework to engage with Beijing for dialogue? Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. <coughs> I should answer the question this one. It says, what's the, what's the meaning of 1992 consensus? We all know that one is constructed, constructed, or oh, that one is created ambiguity between two sides. It's a no consensus consensus. The most, most common one is no consensus consensus. We just put those conflicts aside and uh, keep moving. Here is uh, my vice chair, is Andrew. He was uh, cross-trade uh, affairs minister, and he knows if we want to make everything clear for those kind of issues regarding to trade, regarding to finance, regarding to education, regarding to those non-political issues, may get some trouble. So that's quite practical for KMT's position. We want to solve the problem for the people. So don't waste our time on this kind of uh, so-called non-consensus consensus. So that's the foundation. That's a still the key. Just like Americans one China policy, it's also a 
non-consensus consensus is a created ambiguity. That's my answer. We will, we will go back here in a second, but we received a question from our online audience, uh -huh. which was, if the KMT were to become the majority party again, mm -hmm. would it work with Beijing to try to secure Taiwan's entry into the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP? CPTPP, you say China would be the... Would, would, Beij would, would the KMT want to work with Beijing to try to facilitate a path that would allow for Taiwan's future entry into CPTPP? We would like to be, the, to be invited by U.S. to join the IPAP. That will be more, more important for us. Uh -huh. So you, uh, th and thanks again for coming and taking my question. Um, you mentioned that you wanted to engage with Beijing on more economic grounds, but uh, as we've seen in recent years, um, the economic space has also become a national security space. So do you have a plan for engaging while at the same time making sure that critical, in uh, critical industries are um, secured? Pardon me? Sorry. Uh, do you have a plan for engaging economically while uh, protecting an, um, critical industries? Yeah. You know, because Taiwan, uh, Taiwan's uh, trading partner, as I mentioned, 43% with China. But you mentioned about this critical industry, many about the TSMC or the semiconductor related. Those kind of uh, industry, it's, it's uh, how to say it, it's a, uh, locate many places already. Taiwan, US, European countries, China as well. But a lot of, I want to mention to you, a lot of uh, uh, medium, some small and medium business of Taiwan, they focus mainly Chinese market. So as a government, you cannot ignore those small and medium sized business. So does that mean that uh, the efforts to diversify Taiwan's trade and investment flows would not be uh, continued if the KMT were to? We were diversified, definitely. That's our, our, our goal. No, no government, including, I think, including KMT and DPP, want to focus on one market. But uh, very uh, ironically, when KMT was in power, DPP condemned us as uh, you focus on China. Uh, so over about 50, 40%, so 40%. Now DPP's government, DPP, DPP's administrations, now it's 43%. That's a problem for both parties. So I think the challenge will be how to divide, uh, diversify our market. It's a whole it's not an issue in Taiwan, but also the issue for many countries. So I think we have room for one final question. Um, uh, sorry, those side at uh, the middle with your hand raised very high right there. Uh. <laughs> Hi there, uh, my name is Jefferson. I'm currently an intern at the State Department, and thank you for coming here. Uh, my question is, when you talk about engagement with the West, it seems like you mostly refer to the U.S., and right now, like, the U.S. is trying to get Europe more engaged with the Taiwan-China issue, but they are kind of on the fence because they sometimes have stronger economic ties to China. They don't see China as a threat. So uh, as the KMT chairman, do you have a plan to engage, you know, the wider West uh, members of NATO, not in the United States and Canada, to help defend Taiwan or to build uh, a stronger alliance with Taiwan. So I just want to ask about that, that, uh, that part. Thank you for your comment. Actually, that's what I'm doing now. I'm, I'm doing not only in Washington. During the, the pandemic uh, time this year, uh, I, I spoke to many different countries' uh, ambassadors or representatives in Taiwan. Uh, we, we think, we believe, not only the U United States, but also Canada or some European countries, all those Western societies, they are our allies, not only this country. Thank you. 
Well, we have many more questions uh, that we could ask and explore, but uh, unfortunately our time has come to an end. Uh, so on behalf of Bonnie Lynn and myself, uh, thank you for joining us for this Brookings CSIS co-hosted event, and uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation going forward. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. And thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.